Well, hello, everybody. I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Get Real with Rick Dancer. And tonight we have a really fun show for you. I don't know why I say tonight. It's because I was on the news for so long. So it always feels like night. Everybody should be watching at night. That's the only time you watch this stuff. Um, and I, as you guys know, a year and a half ago, moved to Montana. We end up in Townsend. Townsend's about 40 minutes from the state capital of Helena. Helena and the region is about 60,000 people. So I was shocked when I found out that Helena had a symphony orchestra. And, and then as I'm talking to the maestro, who we're going to talk with tonight, I'm finding out all kinds of other artsy, cool things about this community. So we thought we'd share this with not only our Montana viewers, but also those of you in Oregon, because I know a lot of people are always talking about where they want to go to visit. And I'll tell you, the next thing Kathy and I are doing here is we're seeing they do these tours in the summer here of the old, I mean, this was like a you know, this is the state capital, and this was like a rough town back in the day. And these people get a tour on the little wagons around town. Kathy and I are going to do that. So how do we afford to do all this? Well, we have sponsors, and one of our sponsors is... <laughs> Chris Dental Family Dentistry out of Eugene, Oregon. Dr. Bratland uh, loves to take care of people. Uh, he's the best guy that does crowns that you will find in Oregon. He's amazing at that. And they also do dentures right now. So if you're looking for either one of those, Dr. Michael Bratland, Chris Dental Family Dentistry. And our other sponsor here in Montana, Montana Oral Surgery Dental Implant Center. When I talked to the folks over there, they said, we want to do stuff with the symphony, <laughs> which is one of the reasons we're doing this tonight is they want to be cultured. They want people to understand that culture is important and that's important to the doctors and the staff over at Montana Oral Surgery. And also uh, here locally in Montana, we have Blah, 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 blah. Fairway Independent Mortgage Corporation, Greg Hinkle, works right downtown in the heart of the old district of uh, Helena. And uh, he's a lender in town. If you need help lending in Oregon, Washington, or Montana, he is your man and can get things done for you. So um, I came from Eugene, Oregon, and we had the Eugene Symphony there. And it was such a great addition to everything because we had ballet, we had, you know, concerts, but when you had the symphony, it was always, you know, the special programs that were put on and um, it, it really adds a different flair to a community. So I was pretty thrilled when I found out that Helena had that. And here joining us, Alan Scott, the maestro uh, of our orchestra, the conductor. And it's Alan, it's really good to have you on here. And I, I already just in our little conversation ahead of time. I, we've got a great conversation coming because I had no idea some of the things you told me. So first, how long has there been a symphony in Helena? Well, the Helena symphony as it exists today started in 1955. Prior to that, we were what was called the Helena little symphony that started in 1938. Wow. And then prior to that, we were what was called the Ming Opera House Orchestra, which still is downtown near the on-Broadway restaurant. And it's not a secret that the Helena Symphony is in the process of potentially acquiring the Ming Opera House, going back to our original roots. It's not big enough for our normal concert hall at this Helena Civic Center, but we would use it for our chamber hall and potentially some musician housing and some chamber performances and a community center for music. But we were back in the from the turn of the century when an Irish cattle rancher came and built this hall in 1880 and they brought in from hypnotists to small operettas to um, to um, burlesque type of shows, plays, and in this new mining town before it was even a state. And he died in 1888 and that's when it sort of, um, his sons tried to run it, turned over to the bank, eventually turned over to the city. And then it sat in mothballs until the Shriners, which is the social wing of the Masons, sort of have ran it for the last century. And we're in the process of potentially, it's very potential at this point, exploring. We're in the exploratory phase. What, what do you want to take that over? So what do you want to do with it? I mean, you said housing. Well, and we, we, there, there's a building next to it called the, the light and traction building that housed the generators for the trolleys. And that would become a musician housing unit. And then when we're not using it to rent it out, but also the main opera house would return as the main opera house. It's still there. And we would use it for our Mozart by candlelight all of our symphony kids programs, anything involves a little bit smaller, our weekly course where we have an excellent 120 voice chorus 
they rehearse. We would use it potentially for the orchestra rehearsals. We rehearse three to four days before a performance, before we move into the Civic Center potentially. Um, and I use it for office space, community space for people to do things. There's a full commercial kitchen and a social wing of it down underneath. Um, there could be so many cool things. It's such a cool thing right now to be repurposing. You see it throughout the country. I was conducting yeah. in Atlanta, Georgia, and I saw things there they were doing. So you'll see it in these old towns, taking these older buildings and repurposing them. We don't want to repurpose. We want to bring it back to its original purpose that it's been sort of sitting there for almost a century. Wouldn't that be fun to have, you know, vaudeville shows or, you know, just things like that, just that groups that want to put on place and interesting stuff like that would be such a fun community because that's really what the symphony and music and art is, is about for a community like any community, but that's why it's so important to Helena. It's, it's really that, that community connection, don't you think? Well, yeah. And that's when I came here, I'm entering my 21st season. And when I came wow. here, I'm like, yeah. I came here and I thought, my God, my agent at the time, I was, they said I'd be one of the finals for this job. I said, what am I going to, I'm a Philly boy, you know, <laughs> second generation Italian kid. My mother's parents are from Italy and the what in God's name? Like, I don't hike, I don't ski, I don't fish, I don't hunt. I don't do it. And I still don't. <laughs> um, and I know how to cook and I know how to, and to conduct. That's about it. And, and um, when I thought, all right, I'll be there for three years. And I want it stated. And I told my agent and my lawyer, 20, three years ago, I wanted in my contract that I don't have to live there. I thought, what am I going to do at home? And so it did say that a year and a half later into the contract, I moved here and I thought, I think I could do something here. And um, the orchestra is a full regional professional orchestra with sometimes upwards of 20, 24 concerts a year. And we have one of the largest summer concerts in the entire country, 18,000 people yeah, from all I over the United States come to this concert. I went last, not this year I was gone, but last year I went and, you know, I thought it was pretty good, Alan, that you are such a good conductor that you could actually join forces with God and have a thunderstorm at the beginning. And it was like crash. Boom, yes, we, uh, I, yeah, for about 20 minutes and that has happened. But this 18,000 people, they line up Friday afternoon to get in for a Saturday night, 830 concert fireworks, the whole thing. And we do all different kinds of things, but it's the most beautiful sunrise. Yeah, you get a little rain once in a while. This year was picture perfect. Um, and people just line up and they come from all over the country and they bookend their vacations to Montana with this concert. And it's free and we don't make a dime and it costs us about $150,000. And about $2 million goes into the economy. We don't see any of it. So in addition to all the things you're saying about music making for a community, the other big thing is the arts is one of the largest economic drivers. I've worked in Philadelphia huh. and helped raise money. I, part of my job is working with large, large donors. And I can tell you that um, for every dollar that's spent into the arts, over 10 of it goes into the community. Even wow. though professional sports brings in billions with a B, it, the economic impact is very small where the arts is the largest economic driver, even more than taxes in many cities, of what brings not only a culturally rich community, but it impacts socially, educationally, and definitely financially. Because when people go to the arts, whether it be a play or a rock concert or a jazz club or a symphony or, or, or a ballet or an opera, they're usually gonna go out to dinner beforehand because they purchased their tickets in advance about 50% will do something before, about 30% will do something after, particularly younger couples when going out, having their date night is definitely more of a once a month thing as opposed to weekly. And so they have to get a sitter. So if they're going to get away from the kids and go out, they're going to make a whole night of it, right? right. So they're going to go out and then they're going to go to a, they're going to go see the gig or the show or the concert or whatever. And then they might go out even afterwards. And then the other thing is, um, even when people go to fine arts like museums, there's a big draw from when you do stuff like that, that feels cultural within 48 hours, people quote unquote, want to better themselves. It used to be you buy the CD CDs aren't as much of a thing anymore, or you buy the art print. Um, you want to feel like you're making a, a difference in your own life. When you go, when you, when you go to a great uh, opera or jazz club or ballet, or even a rock concert, you want something not only to remember it, but you want something that 
that really feels personal to you. And that drives economic impact. And oh, so um, the arts brings more money to any economy um, than almost anything else. And so when a community, and I've spent uh, decades working with who was then Governor Rendell, became or Mayor Rendell of Philadelphia, and then he was Governor Rendell. And we worked on building the Avenue of the Arts, raising tens of millions of dollars. And we went around with Kevin Bacon's sister. She was on the, one of our people. And we went around and we talked about this. And we talked to people who understand that, yes, they can give their money to whoever they want. My job and our job is to get them to understand to give to us. And the worst thing that happens is they say no. But generally, people are extraordinarily generous. Because in the United States, we're the only major industrialized nation that is not supported. The, 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 the government does not support the arts. To give you a simple uh, huh. example, in Germany, they give about $7 per capita to the arts. In the United Kingdom, it's about $4, and equivalent to $4.50 per capita to the arts. In Canada, it's about $1.50 per capita to the arts. In the United States, it's less than one-tenth of one penny per capita. So when, when you see during election time and um, politicians suggest, oh, we're going to cut the NEA, cut the NEA. It's not going to make a hill of beans because there's hardly any money going to it to begin with. Right. Um, so, per capita to the arts. I mean, if they want to cut it, it's not saving anything. So Alan, maybe, you know, that's, that's why we're culturally having some difficulty right now. Because You know what I mean? If we're, because I think, you know, I noticed it back when my kids were in school. Um, they started cutting art stuff, all kinds of art classes. Music got cut in the district we were in. And I, I thought that was a really a naive move on people's part because so many kids and so many children, that's, you know, like there's a group of kids that relate to auto shop. There's a group that are metal shop. There's, there's some into cooking. But when you take that, that music out there, you've, you've lost a, a, a language that some people, that's the only thing that makes sense to them in school. And when you keep that in there, it, they do better in other other subjects because there's something to connect them to the school and the other people. And aren't we like that culturally, too, is you're, you're saying to me that, Helena, you know, you invest in the symphony, not you, but the people invest in the symphony. The ripple effect goes out and you create a, a community where where people take care of each other and where they're they're concerned about each other. You know what I mean? When that's important. And I think I, I, you kind of I'm having a little brain you know, bombs here. This is cool. Well, but I think it, it's true. And it's just, um, we see this all over the United States, particularly. Yes, we have extraordinary amounts of wealth. You know, I was just in Europe for three and a half weeks conducting in Germany and then in, in Eastern Europe. And then, um, and I see this, yes, the, it's supported. And you would never see the European um, individuals or companies donating massive amounts of money to the arts because the government covers a lot of it just like they do healthcare and they do they, they're yes we could argue about taxes and that's a political conversation but th it's very interesting that the united states is the only industrialized nation that doesn't have guaranteed paid vacation for its employees yeah we're the only you know it's just there's it's we and and so why i i'm very proud that you know we have this incredibly diverse country that's a melting pot of cultures and i'm very proud of it and i'm proud that i'm a part of this country um, but I'm also suggesting that there's there's a reason why that other countries who have, you know, Germany's this exact same size geographically as Montana. Montana has seven orchestras, basically, one opera company. In Germany, it's the exact same size, 80 million people, 80 opera companies. Wow. And yet there's there's then there's also the the Berlin Philharmonic, which is one of the greatest orchestras in the world. I mean, so my point is, is that. I think what we value as a, as a, as a culture, as a society says a lot. If we value yeah. healthcare, if we value, if we value education, we value the arts. They generally go, all go hand in hand. It makes us who we are. And I just come back to, look, I was raised in a very political family. My father's politician in politics and all this. And I was raised to learn that we have to choose our priorities. And to me, um, when we see communities that are investing in their schools, their hospitals, they generally are investing in the arts. Right. Um, it just says a lot about who we are and who, and I think what, that's the great thing about music, especially, it's not just capturing who we are, it's capturing who we ought or will or want to be. Right. And this, when we go back thousands of years, we're not looking back at like, well, 
you know, what was the, the money look like? We looked at how did they express themselves? How did they dance? How did they paint in the caves? How did they, how did they bang on drums? We talk about this as the, you know, I was just conducting in Bulgaria wow. for, for two and a half weeks. And usually most cultures, we speak Italian to each other and I speak fluent Italian and we can't, and I can communicate with any orchestra, but they didn't really. And only 8% spoke English, but yet we all read the same notes on the page. And when I conducted, they knew exactly what I wanted. I think it's the, one of the few true languages that we can communicate without actually ever speaking. And they know exactly what I want and yeah. what they're and the composers are writing a language that we all understand. Well, you could go really to an, you, you could go to an opera, and it can be in Italian. And I sit there, and I may not know what all the words mean. But I, it's I, you know what I love about it, Alan, because I, I did this in Eugene one time. We went to one, and they didn't have any no translation. And I, I, I was sitting there getting to figure out the opera myself. So I was kind of creating my own movie, and they they had like a you know, the skeleton set out for me and I could get enough from what was going on, but I also got to fill in the blanks because there were no words and the music, what made it go and kept it moving. It was like so phenomenal because I walked away from that experience thinking, I don't need English to communicate beauty and love and, and life and death and all those kind of things. You know what I mean? And silliness and absurdity and, and stupidity, because it's all that. The reason why we call them soap operas of like the television stuff is because they're escapist entertainment. Man walks in, sees woman, two acts later, they fall in love, three acts later, he kills her, she dies of consumption. I mean, <laughs> this is what this is this is the point. But but you can go to an opera and have the translations in front of you in any in most in many languages. And so it's there to provide, but that's what I love about opera. Opera's meant for the average person. And so what we do at the Helena Symphony, it's not like, oh, I have to, these are the same people that are hiking, fishing, and hunting. And our average audience age, Rick, I'm so proud of this statistic. The average audience age of most classical music in the United States is 65 to 68. The average audience age at the Helena Symphony is 48 to 52. Wow. And that's because we're not, we're not dumbing down. We're doing Mahler. We're doing an opera every year. We do a lot of stuff for kids. It's because we show that what do you need to know? Nothing. You just need to come. Right. And you, and you don't need to have a tuxedo. You just need to come. And believe it or not, there's so many people, particularly in Helena, who are transplants, not just from Oregon, but transplants from Chicago and Los Angeles and New York and Texas. And they're coming from other cities and they want a small lifetime, small town feel. But they still want to say, I still, why doesn't our great town deserve an excellent orchestra? Right. So they have a, they have a full professional orchestra here and um, that has a concert every couple of weeks. Okay, so when you first came here 23 years ago, you wanted your contract to say you didn't have to live here. And <laughs> so what what changed for you? What did you see? There had to be some kind of, I like the way you're looking right now. You know what I'm saying. You had, there was a spark. And what did you see that Alan Scott could do that it was going to may, maybe not only happen in Helena, but Helena gave you the place to do exactly what you wanted to do. And, you, and I am getting the feeling you, you did it. Well, I mean, I was instead of I was commuting to Colorado at the time. I was and and in, I was had my orchestra in Philadelphia, and I just swapped. I just said, "All right, I'm going to leave Colorado and I'm going to go to Helena, and I'll just commute from Philadelphia." And I did for a year and a half. And then, um, they said, you know, they they offered me an extension, and it was pretty long, and I, I didn't want that. And I said, "I'll stay until I think it was 2009." And then they extended to 2012 and then to 2020. And then right around COVID, they offered me a lifetime contract, which I didn't even know what that meant. And so we, my agent and my lawyers, we sat down and I just said, well, I wasn't planning on going. My contract was up in 2026. And I wasn't planning on going anywhere, but I just said, um, they wanted to seal the deal so we didn't have to redo it all the time. And they didn't want me to leave. And I felt very honored by that. But yeah. going back, when I came here as a guest conductor and they went through an international search, I said, no, I wasn't interested in the job. I left. They called me back six months later. said, would you just come back and talk to us? And, and I, they said, well, why are you saying no? And I said, because you keep asking me why Helena. And I kept saying, they kept saying, why do you want to come to Helena? And I was very direct. I said, I don't want to come to home. <laughs> I said, you, I said, well, what, and I would say, you don't, if you don't know what you want, how could I possibly know what you want? 
I know what I'm capable of doing. And I know what a music director has to be a leader in the community and has to be engaged in the community and has to bring artistic excellence and also bring people together to bring the resources. But I said, I need to know what you want. But well, they brought me back six months later and they said, look, we've been through other candidates. We, we are very interested in talking. We know what we want. We talked more and about six months after that, then I was very intrigued. And so I came and I said, all right, I'll sign a three-year deal, but I don't want to live here. And for a year and a half, I commuted. So, and I came here 10 days a month, whether I had a concert or not. And I started seeing things like happening and there was, there was an energy. And I thought if I was here all the time, I bet we could capitalize on this. And I said, what if I just commuted to Philadelphia because my I had family there, friends there, I could easily do that. And this became a much bigger job. Um, when I got here, the budget was less than 200,000 with 60 some thousand in debt. Now their budget's 1.3 million and wow. no debt. And um, I think the largest donation then was $500. Now the largest donation, we have plenty of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, $70,000 donors. Wow. Companies that, <clears throat> that, are, that, are, that are generously giving and sponsoring. Um, we had a staff of about two and a half people. Now we have a staff of 17, um, half full-time, half part-time. And um, people come from all over. I think you met with my director of development and Cameron Betchy. And she, she called me in, uh, during COVID and said, I just want to know how you're handling major gifts and grants and foundation during this era of a national pen. And I said, who are you? And she, I thought she was a grad student <laughs> doing a paper. And she goes, well, I was working in the development department in the National Symphony at the Kennedy Center. And I said, well, we have this opening for director. But she goes, well, I'm only 22 years old. You know? I said, you need to come here. Yeah. And so I brought her up for, and I hired her. And I turned down all these other people who had been in the business for a long time because the reason, the same question, the answer to your question, she was drinking the Kool-Aid. She got it. She saw the vibe. She saw what was possible. And now she's a rock star. She just won last week. She just won the, the Association of Fundraising Professionals Best Young Development Director wow. in like one of the best in the country. So Cameron, congratulations. So, so we're bringing the right team. I know. She's so great. And so – we're bringing the right people together. And I always say like a conductor makes no sound. They're only as impactful as the people in front of them. The orchestra allows me to be, they can easily ignore me. They know how to count the three, four, five, and six. They can count. They allow me to influence their sound, but they could easily not. It's the same when I'm off the podium, the community, the board, the staff, they allow me to have an impact. They allow my vision for where we want to be and what we're potentially capable of to come through. They could easily ignore it, but they embrace the vision that I set. And um, that's what's got, got us ahead. And so it's their receptiveness, their willingness, and then the audience who trust me, even when I do something a little different. Um, and still 16, 1700 people come to every concert. That's um, great. That's pretty amazing. And most orchestras in New York City would wish for those statistics. So when you, um, so, when, when you put this together, so talk about some of the other things that are going on art-wise, because don't, and I'm not trying to give you, you know, all the credit for this, because these other organizations I'm sure are doing, but when you have a symphony and then it, it spurs off the pottery, the other, I mean, it, it, that's the steam that starts to grow that people don't quite understand. It's a catalyst when you have a professional orchestra like that. What has spun off? And again, for the other groups, we're not saying that the symphony made this happen, but I think when you have that kind of organization with that sort of budget, it brings that sort of person. Right. Well, we have a symphony chorale and 120 voices. There's other several other community courses in the region. But the other things that existed, some of which even before the symphony, um, the Archie Bray Foundation, which is one of the, I think it's the only ceramic foundations where they choose, I think, a dozen of the greatest ceramic artists in the world, not just the United States, to come and live here. There's a whole, next time you come to Rowling, you go to Archie Bray. It's, I'm not kidding. I was raised Roman Catholic. I abandoned all organized religion after I went to this place. It became my source of reflection and church. I knew, oh. I don't know anything about pot, pottery or ceramic art. I simply, I, I was conducting regularly in New Zealand about 10 years ago. 
and I was there once and I walked into a, a museum or what a little gallery I had an afternoon off and I was just exploring and I they said, Oh, where are you? I said, Well, I'm from Philadelphia, but I live in Helena, Montana. You probably don't know. And they stopped, they said, Oh, we know Helena, Montana. It's where the Archie Bray is. It's the greatest and it's internationally renowned. And I go, I go over there, you walk around the campus. It's this big outdoor complex. You can go into the studios where the artists are making their work. There's galleries where you can see it. It is, there is no place like this I've ever seen on the planet. Huh. And that brings Helena world rec international recognition because of the Archie Bray. Archie Bray was a bricklayer, I, I think about a century ago, and he started these kilns and all the old kilns from almost a century ago are still there, but they have these modern complexes an education wing where people can take pottery lessons. They have all these galleries, they have all these events there. And then were all these artists from Italy, from Eastern Europe, from Russia, from throughout the United States, North and South America come, who they get accepted as like a, a, I guess like a fellowship. They live in our community and they work and they have their own facility here. It's unbelievable. That's crazy. I this is no, why I've Helena never Mont heard of that. 90% of the people who visit the Bray, I believe, it's some statistic like this, are not even from Montana who just visit. The majority of the money and the donations are not from Montana. So I know people born and raised here who have never even been there. I go there six, seven times a year. Huh. I'm stressed. If it's cold, dead of winter, heat of summer, I just walk over. I go on their campus. I pull in. I bring artists, guest artists who are performing with us, soloists, internationally around soloists who come and perform with us. I say, I'd like to take you somewhere. And I take them. We drive over. I take my little Tesla over and we go over and we sit there. And I'm like, this is Helena, Montana. This is the Archie Bray. And it, they're like, there's a potter shrine and you feel this energy you go into this little space and you're like, what? It's more magical than any spiritual experience I've ever had. More than yoga, more than reflection, more than meditation, more than religion. This is it for me, man. And so huh. that's just the Archie Bray. Then we have the Grand Street Theater, which is a community theater, but very yeah. good. There's a other theaters in town. There's the Myrna Loy Performing Arts Center. Oh, Myrna Loy is named love after the Myrna. film actress, and it's and it was a jail. The Myrna. It's Loy. in the it old jail. jail. We go to the movies there. That's like the we love art films, and we, we when too. we came here, we're like, oh my gosh, because we have two of them in Eugene, and that's like, oh my gosh, they have a Myrna Loy, and you go in there, and the bars are still in there. It's a beautiful building. And when the and Myrna Loy like, was born and raised in Helena, and she was born outside of that. Helena. As that's why they named it after her. And so she was an actress during the black and white film days, named it after convert the whole jail. And they have a large auditorium, which sometimes you get eclectic dance and jazz and rock and all these cool things. Then they have like the little screening room, which is probably what you're talking about with like 10, 30 seats, something like that. Yeah. And then they have the bigger hall, which is about 180 seats, but there's all sorts of eclectic things. It's well, the civic, really the, this place. The civic center. Um, we went and saw a concert there. It's beautiful inside, and it, what that's weird, the home of the Helena Symphony, what, and what that used building. to be that's like the right. Everybody building. thinks it was a mosque or something. That's no, it, it was the like. Shriner. It was the Shriners when they outgrew the Ming Opera House. They built the Civic Center. Okay, and at the time there was a little back and forth between the Catholics and the and the Shriners with the Masons, the Shriners social wing of the Masons, and when they were laying the cornerstone of the Capitol. The, the Masons did a little ceremony and the incoming Catholic bishop was warned by the outgoing Catholic bishop, watch out for these Protestants, you know. So the Catholics built Carroll College and the cathedral as sort of bookending what would have been the city at the time. The Masons responded by building the Civic Center just a few feet taller than the cathedral. And <laughs> so this back, so the Masons abandoned it after some earthquakes in I think 1935, 36, gave it to the city, it sat there. Comes along the Helena Symphony in 1955. By the early 1970s, we moved over to the Civic Center. And that became, we were the principal resident time where the next regular resident uses it maybe five days a year. We'd used it about 60 to 70 days a year. And in addition, there's obviously a ballroom with weddings. It's a, but they tried to keep some of the original decor of the Masons, which are based yeah. in sort of these Egyptian Nile, because the women's group's called the Daughters of the Nile. I'm not a member of any of these, so I don't know it really, but. The acoustics are actually horrible because it was not meant to be a concert hall right. with all due respect to the Civic Center. But we have a shell in there. We've tried to do some things. There's, you know, The city knows I've been pretty outspoken that I really would like a regular hall. But we have an enormous floor area for an opera pit. So if we do op when we do operas um, and it's the largest 
seating capacity hall in this state of Montana. So we have, and, it holds and it is really about cool. 2,000 people. It just feels, we went to- The bathrooms are like the four seasons. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, yeah. It's a, it's There's cool. some cool things so, that they try to do. So to, to outsiders, to people that are not from here, um, what's the magic of Helena, Montana? For me, not being a, a skier, hiker, fisherman, or hunter, not being, that's not my background at all. Whenever I'm traveling, I was going for almost a month in Europe. Even when I go to Philly for 10 days and come back, I am so happy to come home here. You can have an amazing, yes, the housing prices since COVID have gone. I mean, we're very lucky. We live in this beautiful home right here in Reader's Village, but housing prices have gone through the roof like everywhere. But it's, you, your dollar generally was a lot farther. It's a, the weather. People think from Philadelphia, they always say, what is it like uh, always in snow? No, <laughs> zero here is warmer than 30 degrees in Philadelphia. There's no humidity. Yeah. They call Montana the last best place. That's what Montana's nickname is. The last best place. Not just big sky country because the weather, even when it's cold, it's still perfect. You don't need a shovel. You need a broom. There's, right. And, and yes, there are a couple of weeks of, of, of below zero and they can get a little rough, but in Helena, it is almost picture perfect every day. Um, we, we don't have much of an autumn. We go right from summer to winter, but it's picture perfect. It could be 100 degrees and you barely need the air conditioning, maybe a little bit. And the winters, they're just not, I'd rather winter here than Philadelphia winters any day where you, you, know, you can't even go outside if it's 40 degrees in Philadelphia. 40 degrees here, you can walk out in shorts. So yeah, last, the, it was the, funny, the lifestyle... Just- Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say the lifestyle is so great, but there's kind of a secret that I'm probably violating. And that is you're not, you're supposed to tell people that it's awful because you don't want people to come here. That's the big joke in Montana. There's only 1.2 million people in the whole state and it's the fourth largest state geographically. Yeah. When I first came here, I I did a podcast before I got here and I said, I'm moving to Montana and I've had Montana viewers. And I said, so uh, what, what are the things I should and shouldn't do? And I heard some F words and to go home and, you know, a, a lot of stuff like that. But, but what the best advice I got was when somebody asks you where you're from, say not California, then you can tell them where you're really from. <laughs> and they said, and you'll That's be right. in. Nobody will <laughs> care. It'll be like, okay, yeah. so I could say if I said Oregon, they'd go, oh, what did you bring your blue politics with you? But if I say Cal- not California, then Oregon, then they kind of go, okay, you get a little bit of a pass. <laughs> Well, that's what that personally and politically speaking for a moment. I mean, we get all walks of life with supporters, but personally, I'm fairly left. What I love about Helena, we have a Liberian refugee mayor, one of the few uh, black Americans who live in our town. He's our mayor, an amazing individual. His wife's on our board. Um, Helena is fairly left. Um, I do love that personally because they embrace the arts. The school district is really pretty good. We have we have the two number one restaurants in the state of Montana here in Helena, Bella Roma, which is a guy from Rome. And of course, I'm very partial to. Um, and he's from Rome and he has this amazing restaurant. And then there's Lucas, which is fairly good. And that's usually ranked in one of the top three in Montana as well. Huh. We have the two of the best restaurants in, Mon- in Helena uh, right here. And um, the weather. I like the fact that this is a community that loves the arts. I mean, I'll walk into a grocery store and people will stop me and talk to me about why they liked concerts, what they liked. And um, it's not just the symphony under the stars that we do. It's it's all season. Our symphony kids, our masterwork series, our Mozart by Candlelight, our Christmas in the cathedral. Um, The arts is such a fundamental part of everybody's lifestyle here in Helena. And um, it's just it's fairly magical. And 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 we have a beautiful. I think that's why I love Helena. Your downtown is just, I think people don't, if, that don't, that if, you know, if people are just driving through Helena, they're never going to see it. But you go down there and you feel like, you know, some bad stuff happened with politicians and the Montana Club and all those old buildings and the, you know, the Power Townsend buildings and all that. It's like, you know, that this was like a, a, a feisty town back in the day. And that history still feels like I went to a, my wife and I were, came in town, went to a movie. And then Saturday night, they had one of their, I think it was the last of their downtown concert series, had this great little band there. Oh, the Alive at Five, yeah. Yeah, and they were playing um, all like 
Michael Jackson and seventies and eighties music. And they're, the that's a very popular packed. band called 10 years gone. There are people okay. love them. They're amazing. Oh, there was packed and everybody was having a great time. And I looked around with my wife and I was going, this is so cool because it felt like it was, um, not just one group. Sometimes like back in Oregon, you feel like there's one group of people that hangs there. And in Montana, you don't have a, we all need each other. <laughs> you know, you kind of have to stick together. Red, red, blue, left, right. It doesn't, it's, it's not overwhelming. And, and, and you know, I think I like that until recently, Mon, until recently, Montana was, there was a misconception. Montana was a fairly purple state. Oh, we had two democratic governors for 16 years. Only recently did the state go more red. Now, Billings and other parts of the state, unfairly, but Missoula, Butte, most of Bozeman, Helena are fairly left. <clears throat> it's the spots in between that are not. But, but it was a fairly um, collaborative um, state. We've had 16 years of Democratic governors. The attorney generals were mixed. Our two U.S. senators for the longest time were both Democrats. Now we have one, one Democrat, one Republican. We have a new congressman. So we have two congressmen now. They're both Republicans, but that's a, probably a toss up. Um, so having that sort of balance is good. Right. Yes, things went a little wonky the last time, but politics is a pendulum. It always comes back. So I think I think up until re I realize that's a very divisive topic these days, but it didn't matter because when you're in Helen, yes, there's this attitude of like, oh, we don't want people coming in. But that's sort of the joke. We like to keep it small. They want to keep it. But almost every single person here came from another or their parents came right. from another city. That's it. That's what you learn really fast. When people say to me, where are you from? And so now what I've started asking back, what, where did you come from originally? Where are your people from? And there's right. very few just straight very few Montanans. It's yeah. Like, and um, and. Yeah, and, and I think okay. it's, and I that's, think that's the same the, in Oregon. It's the same in I mean, exactly. I was a native I was a native Oregonian and people would go, Yeah, only the natives. I go, No, anybody who calls Oregon their home becomes a native. That's how it works. You don't get to tell people I'm a higher rank because I was born here. Um, your immigrant parents came from somewhere overseas and you don't get, there's very few pure native Americans in Oregon and in, in the United States. Most of us have some blood from somewhere else, which is what makes it such a great place. Hey, Alan, that was really, you, now I'm going to have to go look at some of these places. I, I thought I was pretty well versed, but I realize I'm not. And how do people find out? Cause my wife will want to go to the Christmas concert. I'm positive. So how do people find out what concerts are coming, what, what the schedule is, where do they go for that information? Yeah, obviously there's a website, HelenaSymphony.org, but <clears throat> the easiest way where you get sort of like accurate what's going on, reminders, the Facebook page, I would say, I was, Cameron told me, it's like three quarters of our uh, people come from social media. We have an Instagram and Facebook, um, and they're really fun and really active, and you'll see young hip people these musicians from all over the country that absolutely love being here world-renowned guest artists come in solo with the orga with the with the orchestra and the crowd um and uh well we, we would love to have you and your wife as our guest first rick just we'll, we'll, oh, we'll man. take care of that just okay I, we, we, for sure we would love to come to that that because she just um we had so much fun at the, it was Clint Black and it wasn't my favorite concert, but we got free tickets and we said, let's just go, let's just go. And we went in and yeah. we walked in that building and I went, oh my gosh, this is in hell. But see, I felt the same way, Alan, when I went in the Catholic church the first time. I walked in Cathedral there. here? The cathedral? Yeah. I was like, yeah. what in the hell is this doing in Helena, Montana, who built, I mean, my sister travels all over the world and she's been to a lot of, she's Catholic and she's been to a lot of the, the Catholic, the Basilica and all these things like that. Dan, Dana said when she, we, we took her through there and she goes, Rick, this ranks right up there with the, with all of those. She goes, this is, I think it's the only beautiful. Gothic architecture in Montana. I, it's something you, you there's, there's some history on it, but I think it's one of the only Gothic architectures in Montana it's brilliant. The stained glass windows, the art in that building oh. is, is just, it's exquisite. And it's, and for those who are um, uh, subscribed to Catholicism, it's especially moving for them. But I mean, even if they're, you're not just to go through the building and appreciate the architecture and the serenity of the space is, is absolutely brilliant. So yeah, there's always um, people. This is I what Helena has to offer. 
I always want to go in there and I used to sing at weddings and I wanted to sing the Lord's prayer because you could get that echo in there, you know, and I, I always, but there's always people in there and I think, no, I'm not going to ruin their experience, but it's like someday I'm going to walk in and there's not going to be a soul in there. It'll just be God and me. And I'm going to, I'm going to do it because <laughs> it's such a beautiful place. Alan Scott, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and uh, we appreciate you. And um, yeah, I'll get in contact with you. I would love to do that Christmas concert. My pleasure. All right. See you later, Alan. Thank you. Uh, um, so, yeah. So, Rick, we'd love to have you. What, what, can I just ask a question? Why the hell did you go to Townsend? What brought you to Townsend? <laughs> why, why Townsend? Like, that's in the middle of nowhere. We found a house um, that, you know, that we, we wanted to do an Airbnb. So we did the basement is the, an Airbnb. And we love having folks in there. It's so fun. And then we're on the top. But it is a little far because we go to Helena. We go to Capitol Gym. I am probably in Helena about five days out of the week and weekends we go in and, you know, we're doing things and, and hanging out. Like I said, we were, you know, go to the movies in there and hang out and do stuff. And Myrna Loy is like one of our, so do you like your food shopping and all that in Helena? You do that in Helena yeah. or you do that in town? Yeah, no, we do that in Helena because they only have one little grocery store. Yeah. So, yeah. So we, you know, we came here we didn't really know where we were. The town's very nice and it's little, but um, we, we wish we were just a little closer to Helena, but we do, that's one of the reasons we said, okay, we'll do this because we knew Helena was close by and we could, um, if it was, you know, like an hour, we probably wouldn't have done it because that's just too far, but it's, you know, it's really, you get used to the driving and my wife and I, um, I will, I'll admit, and she would too, is the first couple of months we had quite a few fights because we were used to driving separately to the gym and I do my thing and she'd do hers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's caused us to have much more, intimate time together in the car. And now that that two month period was over, um, now it's like we get, she takes her computer. We get a lot of stuff done while we're in the car driving. I'm driving and she's over on her computer and uh, you know, you get real good conversation. We even have little, a little book. Sometimes we'll sit there and go, okay, so what's the best thing that's going to happen in your day today? And I'll say, well, I'm going to interview Alan Scott and I'm going to do this and find out more about the symphony. So she, so we know what each other's doing. So it really has been good. But those first two months, there was a lot of fights. <laughs> well, we my wife and I, we built a gym in this house. Um, and so, well, it was all right. We I'm telling you, man, we got our house before COVID. I was living over by the um, I was living somewhere else. And I'll tell you, it, we moved here. We were so lucky because now this house has skyrocketed in terms of. Oh, value. I'm sure. The homes here. Well, even since nuts. we've been here a year and a half, ours is just off the charts. I mean, and you know what? Another thing I want to mention for people to see, too, is one day we were early for the movies, you know. So I said, hey, let's go drive around um, the old district of where the old houses are. The mansion right? district. Oh, my gosh, Alan. There yeah, I used to rent one of those. They're stunning. I mean, I think people don't realize there was a bunch of money in this town at one point. Oh, it was the lot. We had more gold miner uh, millionaires per capita than any city in the country during the gold gold rush years. It's crazy weird. But anyway, hey, I will let you go because you obviously have someone at your door. But Alan, it was really good talking to you. And uh, I'll get in touch uh, with you. Have, and you have you have Cameron. Uh, you because you, I'll have Cameron get on it to get you some um, tickets. Okay. Okay, perfect. Alan Scott, thank you. When is you this going to air? When is this going to air? Okay. This will be on Tuesday, next Tuesday. So that just so viewers watching it will know what I'm talking about. So it'll be Tuesday, okay. September the 5th, right after Labor Day when okay. people are coming back and ready to get back into school and life. Okay, that would be awesome. All right, I'll talk to you later, man. Okay. All right, thank okay. you, sir. All right, have uh -huh. a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. All right, again, so the Helena Symphony. Uh, if you need to get on their Facebook page, find out more information about it. Um, and I, I think we all just got a whole bunch of things for people that live around here. Um, for me, at least, um, and my wife, there's some stuff we have we didn't know about. So we're going to have to go figure that out. I want to thank our sponsors again tonight. Uh, Chris Dendel Family Dentistry out of Eugene, Oregon. Montana Oral Surgeons, Surgeons and Implant Center. They do dental implants, which are absolutely amazing. If you have never seen that, go on my... Um, on my Facebook page or, um, and you can look it up or on my YouTube channel at Rick Dancer TV. And you can look at Montana Oral Surgeons. We did a video and he tells you how they work it. It's pretty fascinating and, and not scary after you hear that. And also uh, independent, Fairway Independent Mortgage Lending Company, uh, Greg Hinkle, your local lender, if you're looking for a home. 
All right, that's it for now. Uh, we will see you later in the week.